God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, said the psalmist. This assurance gave Morris Ewing a calm and peace to the end. We gather this morning to give thanks to God for the life and the witness of Morris Ewing. Husband and father, mentor, grandfather, horseman, brother, faithful friend and neighbor, leader, and precious child of God. We are here to celebrate his life and to bear witness to our resurrection hope in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. And as we do so, we give thanks to God, who is also our refuge and strength, our present help in trouble. I am Kathy Beach, the pastor of this Rumpel Memorial Presbyterian Church, where Morris and Bonnie have been active members since retiring here to Morris's beloved Blowing Rock. On behalf of the Ewing family, the session of this church of which Morris was an active member, and the entire Rumpel congregation, I welcome all of you who have gathered from near and far to join in this service of worship of God. We gather this morning to worship God and to celebrate the resurrection hope we have in Jesus Christ our Lord, who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Let us pray together. O oh, infinite, eternal, all-knowing God of love and care, we come before you this morning, and we seek your comforting presence. We come with grief and sorrow, with sadness and hurt, because we mourn the loss of a dear husband, father, grandfather, brother, uncle, neighbor, and friend, Morris. At the same time, we rejoice that his suffering on earth is over and that your love surrounds him now even more strongly than it ever did before. Your tender arms embrace all of your children who are accounted among your saints of light, and we know for certain that Morris is among them now, experiencing your love more profoundly than he ever did on earth. O oh Lord God, may your Holy Spirit blow through and among us this morning as we gather to worship you and give thanks for Morris. May you speak to us, even as your Spirit uplifts us and supports us. And may we indeed bear witness to the good news of resurrection hope in our worship of you this day. For it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 20, All Things Bright and Beautiful. It begins with the refrain and ends with the refrain. We will sing all four verses. Please stand as you're able. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
You may be seated. Morris's two children, Elizabeth and Jim, now have some words to share with us. So Mom and Dad came across this poem by Terry Johnson in some of the literature they received from hospice. And Dad really loved it, and so we would like to share it with you today. Standing on the edge of eternity. Here I stand on the edge, looking at this beautiful place. My senses, my body, my being seem revived. Everything is new. The old has gone. I, here I stand on the edge, looking back to where I was. There I see the faces and feel the hearts of those I have left behind. The love I have for them now is even more intense than it was before. Yes, I recall our time together, the good times and the love and the laughter we shared, and it is still with me here. But somehow, there is no pain, no mourning, no tears. I have never felt so alive. Here I stand on the edge, and I'm taking my first steps into eternity. My mind, my senses are so clear. As I take these steps, here on the edge of eternity, I have achieved what I have always longed for, peace. It's always dangerous to leave a minister with an open mic, <laughs> but we wanted to say thank you for being here. We needed to be here with you. Before I share a few memories about my father, I needed to take a moment to formally say thank you to uh, my mother and my sister, who have operated around-the-clock care for my father that would have given Florence Nightingale a run for her money. And I'd like to thank Aunt Greer and Uncle Jimmy and Uncle Wayne for supporting our mother and sharing their skills with them. And there have been countless friends who have shared words of encouragement and love, and honestly, there are too many for us to name, but we are grateful for each of you and sincerely could not have made it to this point without you. The team from hospice, Tammy, Evelyn, Alberta, you were our North Star that gave us guidance when we needed the guidance and assurance and advice, which is a ministry in of itself. And it certainly is no gesture of convenience that we are celebrating Dad's life, bearing witness to the resurrection here at Rumpel. This church has been my father's home away from home his entire life, and we all understand that the church is not its buildings, but it is the collection of the faithful who believe in and serve the higher purpose as they follow Christ and the Christian love that our family has received over these last months is a statement to the devotion of Kathy and to this wonderful and amazing congregation. My father was very proud to be a member here, and we all know that pride is a sin, so he was a sinner of being proud <laughs> to be here, and he believed, he believed so passionately in the mission and the vision of Rumpel. So thank you for being the church when we needed the church. And finally, I realize that some of you have traveled so far to be here. And if a time allows in your schedule, please, please join us in the receptions just right down the stairs. 
but we would love an opportunity to say thank you to you personally. So if you can, we'd love to be there. Now, I know my father, to know my father is to know that he had many different loves in his life. And when I say love, I mean he had so many passions, so many things that were important to him. And his devotion to our mother and to our family taught us the importance of being present in the moment. I remember as a small child playing Superman, flying around our living room in Charlotte with this yellow blanket tied around my neck, held by a safety pin. And I told him that he was the evil villain <laughs> and that he should get on the ground and I, so that I could trounce him and show him no mercy. I am 40 years older now. And I have experienced a role reversal, as my children are now the superheroes and have had a number of trouncings <laughs> given to me as the evil villain. And I can appreciate the sacrifice that he and his body made <laughs> by letting a five-year-old Superman thwart an evil villain. But more than that, there were ballet recitals. There were soccer matches, there were tennis matches, cross-country meets, piano recitals, horseback riding lessons. He didn't make them all, but he made the majority of them. And when he couldn't, he would apologize repeatedly with the deepest of sincerity when he could not be there. For him, integrity and honesty were the most important virtues that he learned from his father, George, and he tried hard to instill them in us. I must admit, he did a much better job with my sister than he did with me, for I remember the very first lie I ever told. But more than that, I remember how brokenhearted he was when he discovered the little lie. So he sat me down, and we had a man-to-man -man talk. And after that, he told me how when he was a child with our grandfather, his father, and they were in the office of the family business one Saturday afternoon. And it was just the two of them in the office. On the way out, my grandfather opened the company safe, took out a stamp to mail a personal letter. And then he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a nickel that he put in the little stamp jar, a little receptacle that was in the safe. And my dad asked my grandfather, why did you do that? He was the boss. I mean, surely, surely the boss doesn't have to pay for a stamp. And besides that, it was Saturday afternoon. There was no one there. No one would know. And my grandfather he looked at my father, and he said, yes, son, but I would know. And I think it was that moment when the virtue of honesty dictated every decision my father ever made. Now, I'm not sure where my grandfather learned about the importance of honesty and personal integrity. Perhaps it was at Reed Memorial Presbyterian Church there in Augusta. But if my grandfather didn't learn it there, in, at least he learned about the significance of faith because he taught to my father and both our parents taught both Elizabeth and I the importance of faith. For every Sunday when we were in town, we were at church, and every now and then I would throw a holy fit. Every time I would squirm in the pews during the sermon, his hand would slowly reach out over and clench my leg. The more I squirmed, the tighter the grip got. And once I stopped, the hand would slowly retract, pausing occasionally, just to remind me that it was ever ready to pounce again if it needed one rainy Sunday, my father was driving me to Sunday school, and I was giving him my every excuse I could think of for not going. I was laying it on thick. And at the stoplight, he turned to me and he said, you will use every excuse possible to get out of this, won't you? I said, you bet. And he said, Jimmy, 
That was my big boy name. He said, Jimmy, you don't realize this now, but one day you'll understand how important this is. My father was right. Sitting by his hospice bed, watching him sleep, holding his hand, I knew the time that we had together was not enough. It can never be enough. But sitting there, I had all the confidence in knowing that eternity is a reality for him. He was right. Faith is important. Because in faith there is hope, and having hope makes all the difference in this world and in the next. And then there are two last things that I want to mention. If you knew my father, then you might have noticed that he had a thing for horses. (laughs) He rode horses from the time he was old enough to sit up straight. Growing up, he owned a horse named Aladdin that he showed many times in Blowing Rock and in Aiken and in Augusta. He served as ringmaster for 50 consecutive years here at Blowing Rock Charity Horse Show. I asked him once, what was it about these horses that he enjoyed so much? And he thought for a minute, and he said, I think it's the connection, that symbiotic relationship between rider and horse. Two, they become one in this moment. When, when they are in the ring and it is like this choreographed dance where, where neither one can make a wrong step or else the dance is over. So for him, there was nothing else in the world that could be like it. Now next to faith, family, and horses, the thing my father enjoyed was a good quippy witticism. You know, like a, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Those sorts of phrases that were packed full of wisdom and meaning, if you could read just between the lines. And in fact, he would try to come up with his own. You might be talking to him about something, anything, about how many apples you bought in the grocery store. And and he would say, well, that's more than Carter has little liver pills. (laughs) Which apparently is a reference to some 1950s over-the-counter drug that nobody ever got the reference to. But that didn't phase him one bit. It just didn't matter. He used it often. And he was full of wisdom about romance as well. John and I, we were sitting on the porch of the Blowing Rock, watching the sunset, enjoying a beer. Dad was with us. Being the good Scotsman, he enjoyed a single malt. And we were young, single. And so John asked my dad, what was the secret to a long, happy marriage? And dad got serious, and we thought, oh, we have come to the guru. We're going to learn great wisdom here. And after thinking, he said, marriage is a practical institution, (laughs) which honestly killed the moment. It really did. (laughs) But he was right. What he was saying is marriage is not about the wine and roses. Those come at the first, but, but marriage is about a partnership. That is a commitment. You're committed to each other. Whatever the sacrifice to self, whatever the compromise, marriage is about working through the issue or the challenge practically. Because in the end, it's it's only the two of you and God. Another piece of romantic advice he shared was the time my friend Graham and I, we were leaving my house in Charlotte on a Friday night to go pick up our dates for a double date. We were going out and Graham casually asked my father if he had any piece of advice about wooing some young maidens. My dad looked at Graham and said, my only advice is stay away from wild women. Once again, my father was right. (laughs) And finally, the last bit of advice he liked to share was found whenever my sister and I would be leaving home, whether driving back to the dorms at college or, or a weekend, you know, being home, or going out for a night on the town. He would always walk us to the cars, and instead of saying goodbye or goodnight, he would say the same thing as, 
we gave him a hug and got in the car, he would say, code words. Code words was his special phrase that was packed with all of the fatherly advice. Don't talk to strangers. Don't drink too much. Don't do anything stupid. Be careful. Watch out for other drivers. Don't stay out too late. Watch out for your friends. Make sure you have enough gas. Take enough money with you. Check the tires. And please, please, please call your mother. <laughs> I love you. For him, all of that could be summed up in that one little phrase. Code word. So, Dad, thank you for faith. Thank you for family. Thank you for virtues that never lead you wrong. And as you journey on the life that truly is life, we all just want to say code words. Thank you for being here. We need it to be here with you. We turn now to God's word in Holy Scripture, reminding us again today that God's promises are true, yesterday, today, and forever. Our first scripture from the Old Testament is the 121st Psalm, a beautiful and perfect psalm for someone who loved these mountains 
and trusted always in God. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. And then from the New Testament and the letter to the Romans in the 8th chapter, these words of hope and promise. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Morris Ewing loved these mountains. He loved horses people, his family, and the Lord, and probably not in the order that I just listed them. And if you ever spent much time talking with Morris, you also knew that he loved Walt Disney. Now, not the theme parks so much as the brilliant and creative man who started it all. I remember many conversations in my first years here at Rumpel with Morris standing at my office door. That's usually where we have these conversations. He would be wearing a baseball cap with some Disney insignia as we discussed some important plans or process that was happening at the church. And he would often drop in a word or two about the wisdom and creative genius of Walt Disney. And at first, I was a little surprised. Morris didn't strike me as a Disney fan. But then I learned that he appreciated different things about Disney than I typically hear from others. He was not necessarily a fan of the theme park or the princesses. He admired the creative brilliance of the man who started it. Now, I never heard Morris's full Disney speech. He did have one of those. Maybe some of you heard it. But I heard enough of it to know that he was passionate about it. And while talking with the family to plan this service, I was reminded that Morris gave these speeches about Disney over the years, many of them, to students at UNC Charlotte and in his alma mater of App State, to Rotary Clubs, and anyone who was willing to hear and learn. And his Disney speeches always ended this same way. Inside each of us glows a spark of uniqueness, something that is made unique by our passion for it. Our job is to find that spark and cultivate it into a flame that fires the spark of creativity in others. The greatest sadness of all is for any one of us to pass from this world having never ignited that spark within. Do not let that happen to you. Morris, I believe, found that spark himself and had the gift of igniting it in others. I know I am one of many who had that experience. Over the years, I have worked closely with Morris in church leadership, and there are many things that he said and many ways that he encouraged me that continue to stay with me. Small phrases, significant actions encouraging words. He has been a spark in this church, and so much of what is happening at Rumpel now with our building program and capital campaign, our vision and mission, is in part because Morris was an inspirational and integral leader here. 
Morris was deeply grounded, as Jim has already shared. He knew what he believed. He was also willing to admit that he had changed his mind over the years and was willing to admit his shortcomings. He was authentic and approachable and thoughtful. When Morris learned that a daughter of some close friends was in town but embarrassed to come to church here the next morning because all she had was blue jeans to wear, Morris encouraged her on Saturday night, come to church anyway. And then he met her at the doors of the church wearing blue jeans himself. Morris loved people. He never met a stranger. He would engage anyone in conversation and did so, even with his wonderful hospice nurses who cared for him in his final weeks. And I believe that Morris understood what Jesus said when he encouraged his followers to be servants of all. Morris was a servant with the Blowing Rock Charity Horse Show, to which he was devoted his entire life. With this Rumpel Memorial Presbyterian Church, and with the First Presbyterian Church of Concord, and the Covenant Presbyterian Church of Charlotte, and the church that nurtured his faith, the Reed Memorial Presbyterian Church of Augusta. He gave to the listening post at Appalachian State, a ministry that he believed in with all of his heart. He even volunteered to restart the ministry last spring, or maybe strong-armed the group into starting the ministry back, because he knew the students needed it. And so he volunteered for the only shift that happened each week last spring, even as his own health was declining. When we knew Morris's time was short, Stephanie, the Presbyterian campus minister, arranged for there to be a card at the listening post this fall and the students could sign it. And one of the students shared in that card that Morris had been like a father figure for her. And I find this truly remarkable, but not surprising, knowing Morris. Even with just short encounters of a few minutes or maybe an hour a week, he was able to communicate his love and his support for so many students at App State. And Morris served his many, many friends and his beloved family. I'm not sure I had any idea just how many friends Morris and Bonnie had and have made over the years. But I have been touched by so many stories I have heard from folks over the past months and especially in these last few weeks. Morris was a friend to many and the rock of his family whom he loved and served with detail, direction, an unfailing love, because they were his pride and joy. Morris also served us with the gift of his faith that he could beautifully articulate in written prayers. If Morris ever had the prayer at an implementation team meeting or a session meeting, I was always touched by its depth, its theological accuracy, and its creative beauty. Late last fall, as it looked like our capital campaign was going to be a huge success, I asked Morris if he would write the prayer that we would use in worship on the day that we announced that we had made our campaign goal. He agreed, offering that he was very humbled to be asked to take on such a responsibility. And to no one's surprise, he wrote an absolutely beautiful prayer again, and it will remain as a part of this church's history, one of the significant contributions to that campaign. The final stanza of the prayer Morris wrote says this, guide our hearts and hands and those of the generations to come who will fall heir to the work we are about to do. May everyone who comes to Rumpel always find peace, love, learning, and compassionate care through the work of this devoted church and its congregation. As he always did, Morris not only recognized the gift of that day, but was looking ahead to those who would be blessed in the future. And I give thanks today that Morris was one who helped others to find peace, love, and compassionate care through his life and his service as a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
As Morris always said in his speech about Walt Disney, our job is to find that spark and cultivate it into a flame that fires the spark of creativity in others. We thank God today that Morris took his own advice and that our lives were blessed by his ability to spark a flame in so many of us that enabled us to be our better and best selves. Can there be any question that God welcomed Morris home with joy and enthusiasm, exclaiming, well done, my good, faithful, creative, hardworking, enthusiastic, encouraging servant. Well done. Thanks be to God this day for the life and the witness of Morris Ewing. Now that you mention it, my Disney conversation was just out here in the hallway, <laughs> right outside the choir room. <laughs> Our first hymn was Creation. Now we get to talk about the dance. And we remember in Scripture all of the references of number 157, I danced in the morning. We'll sing stanzas one and then three, four, and five. Please stand as you're able. I danced in the morning when the world was begun And I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun And I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth At Bethlehem I had my birth Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And I'll lead you all Wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance Said he I danced on the Sabbath And I cured the lame The holy people said it was a shame They whipped and they stripped And they hung me high And left me there on a cross to Die. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on a Friday when the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back They buried my body and they thought I'd gone But I am the dance and I still go on Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And I'll lead you on wherever you may be And I'll lead you seated. I invite you to join me again in prayer. Let us pray together. Lord God of all, we give you thanks this day that you do live in us and we live in you. And we believe this was the case for your child and servant, our beloved Morris. 
It was clear to all of us who knew him that you did live in him, and we experienced your love and grace and care through his many words and actions. Faithful God, we celebrate and give thanks to you this day for the life of Morris Ewing, one of your precious children, and one who bore witness to your love and unending care in the way that he lived. We thank you for his gregarious nature, his vivacious spirit, his enthusiasm, energy, and ability to communicate so powerfully in both spoken word and in writing. We thank you for his persuasiveness that often nudged us to do something we might not otherwise have done, for his attention to detail, for his groundedness that kept us in reality, his deep faith, and his love for those he held most dear. We give you thanks for Morris's love of your majestic creatures, horses, and for his love of these mountains, for his dedication to the Blowing Rock Charity Horse Show that brought him so much joy. We thank you for his love of young people and his natural inclination to mentor and encourage others, especially these last few years as a dedicated volunteer of the Listening Post. We celebrate his love of all things Disney and his willingness to share about Walt Disney's brilliance to anyone who would listen. We praise and thank you for his faith, nurtured in him as a young boy and in your son, Jesus Christ, that allowed him to live with cancer for many years, matter-of-factly and without showing fear, and that enabled him to face his final days in peace. We thank you for his faith that led him to accept your call to service in the church, serving as an elder in more than one congregation and a respected and appreciated leader here at Rumpel over many years. His love for the church and his willingness to serve was an example for many. God of compassion, even as we give you thanks and praise for this great gentleman, we must also acknowledge the grief and sorrow that we have today. We thank you for Morris and we share our sadness, knowing we will miss his calming voice, his straight talk, his sharp mind, and his dedication to and love for us, and his true and pure love for people. You created us to be in community, to live in families, and we are sustained by this, O oh God, but also sad when a precious one leaves our presence to your tender embrace. And so this morning, we offer a prayer for all those who mourn. For Bonnie, or Bon, as Morris called her, his dedicated and faithful wife of 52 years. Uplift her, guide her, sustain her, O oh God, as she searches for direction without her constant, faithful, grounding, and encouraging companion. For Jim and Elizabeth, who loved their father dearly, who treasured his advice and guidance, his love for their spouses and their children, and who also need your sustaining power this day and in the days ahead. For Carrie and Tracy, Jim and Elizabeth's spouses, and for their children, Morris's precious grandchildren, Alden, Emma, and James, who treasured their pop and their time with him, whether putting their coins in the church, climbing Grandfather Mountain, spending time at the horse show grounds, or taking a ride in Big Red. Pop was always providing an adventure and an opportunity to learn. May they feel your love and care present in many family and friends, and may their precious memories of their dear grandfather remain with them for their lifetimes. For Greer, Wayne, and Jimmy, for Morris's nieces and nephews, extended family, and too many friends to count, we lift up prayers for comfort and pray you surround all those who mourn today. Sustain us, O oh God, in this time of loss and remind us of the resurrection hope that we have because of your gift to us in Jesus Christ. Lord God, we thank you that by dying, Christ destroyed the power of death and by rising from the grave, opened the way for us to eternal life. Help us to know that because he lives, we shall live also and that nothing, nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
We thank you that for your servant Morris, death is past and his pain has ended, and that he has now entered the joy you have prepared through Jesus Christ our Lord. May you lift our sorrow and give us good hope in Jesus, so we may bravely continue our earthly way and look forward to a glad reunion in the life to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Friends, as we continue to bear witness to our resurrection hope, I invite you to stand with me as you are able and for us to join in affirming our faith using the ancient words of the baptismal creed, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Again, singing about creation that we sang of Jesus' walk on the earth. Now we respond. Number 69, I, the Lord of sea and sky, we will sing all three verses. Okay. 
Savior, we commend your servant, our brother in Christ, Morris Dias Ewing. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into your arms of mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of light. And may we all remember the words of our Lord Jesus, offering comfort to his friends who were scared and doubting. And when he said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. So do not let your hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you today and forevermore. Thank you. 